when you look at the science of essential fatty acids and fatty acid metabolism, omega-3s flow down a pathway that creates all these anti-inflammatory compounds in the body. Whereas LA or linoleic acid, which we're talking about the omega-6s, go down a pathway that creates inflammatory molecules. So theoretically, these omega-6s should be inflammatory, but it all depends on context. And everybody needs an anti-inflammatory system and an inflammatory system. It's not that they're good or bad. It's just they have to be in balance. And the other big thing that's changed, uh, aside from our dramatic drop in saturated fat content and our increase in these refined oils, is the difference in our omega-3 content. And omega-3s and the six ratios seem to be pretty important. When you look at the data at a high level and analyze it all, it seems as though a lot of people who don't have the omega-3s, if they have a lot of these omega-6s, they get into trouble potentially. Whereas if you have a ratio that's you know two to one, one to one, four to one, five to one, that's okay. But most Americans are like 20 to one of the omega-6 to omega-3s. And and that I think that's another big issue. We're all we're all not eating wild food. We're not eating wild fish. We're not getting omega three fatty acids. Ninety percent of us are deficient in it. And so you've got a really right. complex matrix of a problem yeah. that makes people think sea dolls are bad, but the, I don't yeah. think they necessarily are. Because all of that data that you presented there is that the facts. That's what you'll come across. It's how you explain those. Yeah. That so for me. I think the omega-3 to 6 ratio is generally a proxy of like overall diet quality. Usually, the higher that ratio, the more ultra-processed foods. And like you said, not getting enough omega-3s. I don't actually think it's inherently the omega-6 that, that's causing the issue there. And I say that because there are clinical trials where you overfeed people omega-6s and linoleic acid, and you measure the amount of arachidonic acid, which is the, the next omega-6 yeah. that's produces. And, Which is inflammatory. Yeah, and right. it doesn't go up. So the right. body seems to buffer it and hold it at a pretty steady state. So where I think, though, that this, this is an issue is that if you're not consuming enough direct DHA and EPA, right, because these two pathways you mentioned, they share the enzymes. So if you have a whole lot of omega-6 running through that pathway and using a lot of these enzymes. It's like trying to get it through a highway. It's a very narrow highway. And right. if you have a lot of one type of vehicles going through, you can't get another you can't type. Get the, so if you're only consuming like plant-based omega-3s, mm -hmm. ALA. Yeah. From flax, chia. You, you rely on right. the conversion to DHA and EPA. But if you have a lot of omega-6s in the diet, that conversion is even lower. Yeah. And so this is where I think then people see increased inflammation. So I think I completely agree with you in terms of what you're putting forward there. And I, I sh it sounds like we agree that a big part of that problem is underconsumption of omega threes, yeah. particularly the direct DHA and EPA. Yeah. Whether you go out and eat fatty fish two or three times a week, which a lot of people don't, Who's and in sardines three right. times a week, I, I and, probably do. <laughs> and or having a good DHA EPA supplement yeah. to make sure that that you're you're getting enough of those long chain omega threes. So at the end of the day, we've got this whole controversy. Seed oils are the boogeyman of of 2025. You know, Secretary Kennedy's called them out. I think not correctly <laughs> at the highest level how would you kind of guide people on how to understand this complexity between saturated fat these plant oils and omega-3 okay oils? because those are the three buckets then and, and 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 as you said earlier they're not homogeneous there's many types of saturated fat there's many types of omega-6 fats there's many types of omega-3 fats right so they're not like monolithic but the but it's important to understand the that the overall diet matrix and complex that you're eating of these things determines the impact on your health, which is end, end of the day what we're talking about here. Yeah, it's the key. And then also your personal genetics. <laughs> oh, that. Oh, that. Yeah, <laughs> right. that, yeah that's, that's very true. Uh, and that's, but, that's but, humbling as a doctor because when you hear people say these categorical things and you go, well, wait a minute. It's, I've seen thousands of people yeah. and the same thing will cause one person's mm -hmm. cholesterol to spike and another person's to drop like a stone. And like, how do you explain that? It's genetics. Yeah, it's genetics. And it's also, again, that a lot of the time the, the change doesn't occur in a vacuum. So I've mentioned off air to you that when I increase coconut oil in my diet, that I see my LDL cholesterol and APOB go up a lot, 30%, in fact, um, on my latest function test. That's because you're metabolically fit. And, and the swap that I made was olive oil is the oil that I cook with, yeah. the extra virgin olive oil. I was swapping that out and adding in coconut oil and then also some coconut yogurt 
And so that swap saw a reduction in monounsaturated fats and an increase in, in saturated fats, particularly lauric acid in coconut foods. And so for me personally, with my genetics and that swap, LDL cholesterol went up uh, quite a bit. What I always say to people to keep this really simple is that, like you mentioned earlier, in 1980s, there was a low-fat recommendation. My review of the literature is that there was evidence that saturated fats were increasing risk of coronary heart disease. But I think the messaging was not clear enough on what that meant at the grocery store and at, at dinner time when you prepare a meal. And so what ended up happening was this low-fat craze where people thought anything that was low-fat was healthy. And what was the swap that, sure. that we really saw? We saw saturated fat you know, foods, which whether it's meat or butter, they cream, we saw those being reduced. And instead of people eating fatty fish, which are rich in polyunsaturated fats or um, nuts and seeds, even tofu or tempeh, these types of foods, whole foods, mm -hmm. the increase came from ultra processed foods, which yes, have unsaturated fats in them, a lot of them, but they're add, added refined sugars, lots of sodium. They're super seductive, <laughs> hard to put down and drives they're the- They're also very inflammatory. Right. So the, yeah. the swap matters. If you're going to reduce saturated fats in your diet, if you go then and eat those foods, I mean, there's a fair bit of compelling data to say that you're just increasing your risk of disease in doing that. And I think we've seen that. Yeah. So the, what you eat instead is really important. And rather than like getting, making this too complicated, let's just come back to a dietary pattern. Why does a Mediterranean kind of diet when across the literature or a Nordic style dietary pattern? Fish, olive oil, nuts and seeds. <laughs> if you look at the research consistently, what, what disease do you want to look at? Type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular yeah. disease, dementia. People that eat that way are mm. protected. And so what I would say is look at those, those dietary guidelines and, and then understand that you can modify that way of eating to be low carb. It can be moderate carb. It can be high carb. What's working best for you, leaving you feeling best with the best blood work, which is then where your, your personal genetics come yeah. into play. And then you can toggle around with it because one person might be able to consume a Mediterranean diet with a bit more saturated fat than the next. But that's really the starting point. And then for me, it's, it's you, you test so you know where you're at. Yeah. Go and intervene. That's the dietary pattern. There is very good evidence to support that way of eating. Retest and then tweak it as, as needed based on the feedback you're this, getting. This is the most valuable kind of data. We call it N of one data. Because when, you, when we're talking about all these studies that we've been chatting about, randomized control trials, observational data, you know, they're, they're kind of regression to them. In other words, it's like a race to the bottom and we don't actually know what's going on for you. So you're, you're putting a group of people and say, you're going to behave like these people, but you may not be anything like them. And the best way to learn is test against yourself. That's why when you did your own self test, of removing coconut, uh, olive oil and adding coconut and then retesting your blood work with function, you could see that your, your numbers change. And that's what I encourage people to do is test, don't guess. And use your body as, a, as its own control group. I would kind of emphasize, though, that that doesn't mean that the guidelines mm -hmm. and all of the science is not helpful because it gives us, it's like a compass. It points us into a direction where we see what the typical result is. Mm -hmm. And then having the humility to understand, well, as an individual, we're not always representative of the typical person. Yeah. Like, where do we fall in that distribution? And that's where it gets fun and interesting. You can play around with it and then you can factor in other things like what are your, your goals? Is it just chronic disease prevention or are you an athlete? You're yeah. trying to build as much muscle as possible. Right. And to me, that's what makes all of this fun. But online, it, it yeah. seems to cause a lot of arguments. It does. And, and, and but getting back to the omega-6s, you know, whole foods that have them are good for you. Like nuts and seeds and, you know, beans, they're good for you, right? So- it's when you kind of extract them through sort of science projects and concentrate them and, and mix them in with all kinds of other junk, which is essentially how we eat them. I mean, most people are not pouring soybean oil over their food, but it's 10% of our calories. It's because it's in all the ultra processed food and that's 60% of our calories. Yeah. So that's the issue, right? Can I ask you a question? I'm, yeah. I'm interested in your opinion on this. So I think with the Kennedy administration, there's certainly a focus on seed oils. Do you think if you were to go out to the current food environment, mm -hmm. maintain all the fast food, all the ultra processed foods, mm -hmm. but you could click your finger and all the seed oils in all those foods was changed to butter or tallow, mm 
but they were still hyper palatable, high sodium, high sugar foods. Disaster. Would it make a difference to to health? A tangible it difference? It would probably potentially would make it worse. And, right. and here's why. I think, you know, when you look at the impact of fats, any kind of fat, you know, when you have saturated fat or even polyunsaturated fats and you consume them in the context of a high starch and sugar diet, which is what we'd have in America, we, you know, out of almost a pound a day per person of sugar and starch, flour, basically, that's what causes the problem. You end up, whether it's saturated fat, so saturated fat, like butter on your broccoli, okay. Butter on your bread, not okay, right? Because the carbohydrate content, and not all carbohydrates are bad because broccoli is carbohydrate, but starchy and sugary carbohydrates actually exacerbate the cardiovascular harm of these foods. And so because you raise insulin and because you're not just letting sugar in your cells, you're letting any kind of energy, free fatty acids, those just pour into your cells, particularly around your belly fat. And it's like the insulin just opens the gate and everything goes in. So when you're eating sugar and starch, you get this high insulin and then whatever fats you're eating, it just becomes doubly bad for weight gain and for inflammation and for everything else. So I think the guidelines should say that we shouldn't have a limit on saturated fat as long as one, we consume uh, a balance of polyunsaturated fats with them, right? So it should be probably like a two to one ratio of, of polyunsaturated fats to saturated fats. And it should be really limited when it comes to refined starch and sugar. So you can't eat saturated fat if you're eating a diet high in starch and sugar because it creates a disaster. I've been interested by some of these Relatively short, yeah. short clinical trials, like 12-week studies, mm. looking at feeding people a lot of saturated fat or polyunsaturated fats. And these are in background diets of Western diets. So yeah. like you said, they're not amazing. But when you, what's interesting to me is that when you dial up saturated fats, you seem to increase liver fat more than when you dial up polyunsaturated fats, yeah. right? which as we know is like often precedes this kind of fatty liver disease type 2 diabetes um but yeah i was just interested in in your view of because it seems like the kennedy administration seems to think that if you eliminate seed oils the problem goes away but i would argue that if 60 percent of calories are still coming from ultra processed foods yeah, that's the problem we still have a problem yeah it's like the ultra processed food that's the issue 